Okay, so <laughs> would you rather, this is what I do when I get the cold open. <laughs> Shit. Would Review you rather? are never good for me. I don't like it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this one's pretty easy, though, potentially. Would you rather have a small-sized stone elemental familiar or a huge-sized stone elemental guardian? They always have to be within 30 feet of you, and they can't ever actually go away. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely going to say the small familiar. <laughs> Yeah. You don't want a lumbering guardian? Look, look, this is my answer. And this is, this is, I think it should be the be all and end all of this conversation. If you've got a 15 foot tall gargantuan or, or huge size guardian, every time that you get freaky, it's going to be watching. It's right there. It has to stay that close to you. And it's just going to be a presence staring down at you. There will be times when it will watch you poop. Yeah. But at least with a small size one, you can stick it in a cabinet or go hide under the bed or behind the couch or whatever. Sit, stay, do what you're told. And not just turn around and don't watch, but I can still hear you breathing. <laughs> yes. And if anything gets, you know, too wild, it is going to interject and be like, are you threatened right now? <laughs> I sense you are threatened. <laughs> God help you if you spank in the bedroom, hey? <laughs> I have rolled initiative. <laughs> Welcome to the It's a Mimic podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome back to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. Today, we're continuing our discussion on elementals in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. I'm Adam, and with me today are Casey and Kyle, and this episode is called Elementals, Down-to-Earth Enemies. In this episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, this panel of Dungeon Masters will dig deep into the dirt behind three kinds of creatures that will rock your players. Before we delve into these gems, I want to ask, how prominently do you feature elementals in your games? Are they set pieces or just random encounters to flesh out combat encounters? Let's roll initiative. Mm -hmm. Eight. Three. Eleven. Um, I don't use them enough. Honestly, uh, elementals for me are usually henchmen that are thrown as a almost, not a random encounter, but they're guards a lot of the time. Or you're just so deep into the wilderness that you stumble upon one. Or you're in a place of like the temple of elemental air. All right, here you go. Here's a bunch of air monsters, right? Like I very rarely just, just make them a set piece or a thing to go deal with. I have too many liches and devils and genies and other big powerful beholders and dragons and angels and shit, right? To be able to, to focus too much on elementals. But I should really start sprinkling them in because they're neat and they're interesting and they're not necessarily expected, right? Fair. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty much the same. They're mostly get summoned in my game, like during a combat encounter. I can't say I've ever really, I've only designed one thing around having an elemental in it. And it was more using it as a uh, like hazardous terrain kind of thing. Uh, than, you know, actually being about the elemental. But mm. I do like them. I just, I, I guess they just kind of fall to the wayside in terms of my favorite style of monsters. They're a lot like uh, plants and beasts where they're so tied to the environment that unless I'm specifically thinking about that environment, I'm, I'm not going to do this, right? Yeah. 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 Honestly, I have never used one. Um and it's because of that. It's like, I feel like it has to be such a specific environment before like they come to mind as an option. Like it has to make complete sense that this air elemental would come be involved in my campaign. But I do like that I have learned about different types of elemental creatures. It's not just your classic elementals, which instantly come to mind. So I feel like like the ones we're going to be talking about today, we they it gives you a bit more options to um, more realistically bring them in without it being such a blazing, hey, I'm throwing an elemental at you today. 
Um, so I think I will make a, a bigger effort to try and use some of these, like, not as known as elemental type monsters and creatures. Yeah, the moment that we get away from the true elementals, just air elemental, whatever, and we get into the monstrous elementals, it's more fun. Way more fun. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, before we go any further, let's uh, run into a quick info break. We've previously covered quite a bit in our discussion on monsters in 5th edition. For all of those episodes and more, you can follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and dozens of other podcast apps. If you would like to support us, you can donate through the website, check out our store, or join our Patreon and get access to other episodes and series. If you would like to pay for some ad space on It's a Mimic, or just send a shout out to a friend, please reach out to us through our email and website that are listed in the show notes below. Hey everybody, I know that I promised that we would catch up on all of those episodes that were missed a couple of weeks back when we got the new editing computer, but it's going to have to take another extra week because I've got to do some unexpected travel to go down and deal with some wedding stuff down in Maryland. Uh, all good news, but it does mean that I will be away from the computer, and because we got a new one, it's not a laptop and I can't take it with me this time. So, there will be an episode on the Patreon this week, uh, but it's going to be one of the homebrew episodes on the Pantheon, as opposed to the Campaign Builder. Now, the Campaign Builder will be coming out next week, it's just I won't be here to be able to post it. So, thanks so much for your patience. We're going to get back into all of those missed episodes. We should be caught up by the middle of May. But for now, let's get back to the episode. All right, so all three of them today are based entirely on the element of Earth. Uh, I think that it's probably the reason we're giving these guys a highlight, not any of the other three right now, is they are so underappreciated. Everybody loves their fire elementals. And when elementals are are necessary for a lot of travel and, and people have a lot of uh, invisibility and stuff with air elementals when it comes to water elementals if you're going to be doing any sort of aquatic or pirate campaign of any kind you run into water but earth I mean, they just like what hang out in caves right that and that's at least what i thought and i never thought about them again i'm like i don't need this i've got other cool shit to put in caves but the ones we've got today are really weird and interesting and they're all in the monster manual mm -hmm. which like these are some of the unsung heroes i think that can really flesh out um an encounter so let's uh grab dice roll initiative and see who's going to be talking about theirs first five six ten i'm going first with a ten that's how it works on this podcast. I'm telling you, none of us can roll higher than a 14 ever, unless we roll a nat 20, but it's wasted because everyone else rolled a seven. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Don't start. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. So I'm going to kick things off with the Galeb Dur. You'll find details in the monster manual for this one. Um, so this creature looks like an animated boulder. In fact, it can animate rocks and boulders itself. The Galeb Dur can be summoned from the plane of Earth by powerful magic. It can also form naturally in places that are connected to the plane of Earth, though it cannot return to that plane if it dies because it is permanently bound to the material plane. Um, it can have false appearance and choose to just look like an ordinary boulder and remain still for years at a time. Uh, its connection to earth allows it to become intimately connected to the stones around it and even use them to frighten away potential threats with that animation. Um, and so there is a big connection to their space and their environment, hence why, uh, the, the stone elemental piece of that, you're going to find them in a specific space and that's really all there is. Um, it holds a higher intelligence than other elementals. It does not age or require food or drink. They have been known to be used as sentinels, commonly tasked with protecting sacred areas or serving as a guard to a specific location like a wizard's tower. The Galeb Dur also has excellent memory, and as long as you don't pose a threat, it is very willing to share information with you. 
Uh, other lore mentions um, additional spellcasting abilities to control the earth, such as move earth, shape stone, wall of stone, or turning rocks into mud. But 5th edition uh, keeps this pretty basic, but I can see how you, if you want to add um, additional abilities, it makes sense. Um, as well, other lore mentions that these elemental creatures should be found in stony, mountainous environments, which also makes sense because they draw their magic from the stone and the earth. But they also mention that they will lose their magic and slowly die if removed from this environment for a long period of time. So that kind of <laughs> feel like, you know, if you want to pull at heartstrings here, just add this in as some flavor if you're bringing in the Gilab Dur. <laughs> so looking at their stat block, they are medium-sized elemental, neutral alignment. Their boulder-like body gives them a natural armor of 16, which I actually honestly thought would be higher. But nonetheless, they have a speed of only 15 feet. However, when threatened, the Galeb can shape itself into a ball and roll for a speed of 30 feet or 60 feet if going downhill. <laughs> um, it can even charge if it rolls at least 20 feet in a straight line towards the target, which will deal extra bludgeoning damage and cause um, the target to make a strength save or be knocked prone. Their ability stats are all above average with the highest in strength and con, which is not surprising. Their added, their added resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, the immunity to poison damage and immunity to exhaustion, paralyzed, poisoned, and petrified conditions will definitely make them harder to kill. We are at a CR of six for the Gale of Dur. Um, a creature that has a language, actually. They speak um, Terran, <laughs> which, to be honest, I had never heard of before. And I'm not really sure if anyone would ever have this language, um, uh, naturally. <laughs> yeah, Charlie has it, as a matter of fact. So Terran, he does. Is, <laughs> yeah, Terran is one of the four primordial dialects. So if you know the language primordial, which allows you to talk to elementals, there are four oh. dialects. So you will have difficulty understanding, but you'll get the general gist if you talk to them, if you don't speak this specific dialect. So Charlie took primordial and I asked him which one. He's like, uh, Ignan, which is fire, right? Okay. So he can talk to fire elementals and he can kind of get the idea for earth, air, and water elementals. I see. Okay. Unless you're a Genasi, it's not likely to, to pop up, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. And I have never played one. I guess it's on my list sometime. Um, but there's also always abilities and spells to get around communication. But this was one where it's like, <laughs> more. it's more than likely. It's not the, does anybody speak giant? Because that's the other one that comes up for us all the time. Yeah. We're never going to expect you to say, who speaks Terran? <laughs> Noted. Entirely Terran campaign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to take away from the challenge that they will be in combat, but the art in the monster manual also makes them, in my opinion, look very cute. And so I kind of want one as a pet. And maybe this is why <laughs> I had the would you rather that I did. Um, but nonetheless, they do not carry a weapon and they use the slam attack. So don't forget about that ability to animate. So they can animate up to two boulders once per day. And the two boulders must be within sight and must be within 60 feet. But they will have the same stats as the Galeb, except intelligence and charisma scores are only one. And they can't be charmed or frightened. But they will be animated up to one minute unless the Galeb loses concentration. So these are kind of like like um, like two extra creatures that you'll have to fight if you decide to go into combat with the Galeb. Like they can still do the slam attacks and everything. So, I mean, it's kind of a fun little thing that I can do. It can just like... 
you know, rally the troops from its friend stones around it and make the fight maybe a little bit bigger. But so, ultimately, that's it. So that CR6 is a sneaky CR like 11 or 12 if you've got to fight three of these fuckers. Yeah, mm-hmm. like it could be a little more like challenging and a little more concerning than what meets the eye initially. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I like them. I think they're fun. Yeah, Why? They, they're so goofy looking. They kind of make me think like a panda that got turned to stone. Yeah, especially since they like roll downhill. <laughs> I love yeah. that. We we don't get that unique like flavor for movement speed where it's 30 foot 30 feet when rolling, 15 feet when they're they're walking or 60 feet if they're rolling downhill. Yeah. What? That's So obviously you're going like if you decide to use them, you are going to make them roll down a hill. Like you must. <laughs> I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, you know what? They're goofy looking if they were like tiny size and they could hang out of my desk, I would love to have it as a pet. I'm with you. Uh-huh. I'm amazed these guys are medium because when you look at them, I feel like they should be 20 feet tall. Like they're just big hulking presence. At, yeah. They're just, and they're just built like Dan. <laughs> I mean, with no neck, but you know, mm-hmm. they're just big guys. Anyway, uh, I've got questions. Let's roll initiative. Oh, I got a 19. Four. Four. 12. All right, so I guess I'm talking to myself. That's <laughs> also a tradition on the podcast. Um, so let's discuss role-playing tips and tricks for these guys, uh, first of all. And the big thing for me is that they're going to be low, gruff, like, pardon the pun, gravelly voices, right? Like, the idea is that they're going to... Did you guys see The NeverEnding Story? Of course, yes. These are the rock biters, right? hmm So... If you haven't seen it, anybody listening hasn't seen it, I highly recommend it. There is a little bit of uh, the nostalgia factor for me, the same way like Labyrinth and Princess Bride has nostalgia factor for people. But it is a good movie. It's weird fantasy, and like the best weird 80s fantasy too, if you can get past the pretty abysmal child acting in it. So mm-hmm. um, no, these guys are, I don't want to say they're slow and methodical, but much like Treebeard and Lord of the Rings, they don't have a need to hurry. Right, these they're guardians, and and because they're neutral, they, they, they don't. I don't think they particularly care unless you're threatening the thing that they do care about. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're um, I and I think I even read online that like they were compared muchly to the behavior of a treant, but f- from the the stone realm. Yeah. Where, yes, that's why their speed is fifteen feet when they're walking, like they're kind of slow lumbering not they're not going to be hasty in any way shape or form unless they're provoked and then that's what's fun and then you get this other side of them (laughs) suddenly you see them like shrink down into a ball and now you're in an indiana jones scenario (laughs) Like, (laughs) like i just think that's so much fun to play with um and just throw out there it's like oh i see you guys aren't worried about this giant thing okay (laughs) i also really love the fact that they're not cave dwellers right they're supposed to be on like the side of rocky mountains and shit and that's fun because when i think of earth elementals i think of the ground and underground not up in the peaks and so i really like this flavor i feel like they would be very comfortable hanging out with stone giants yes yeah absolutely they would they might even be like their source of like infor information a lot of times like they share information with the stone giants and then they go out and talk to people that are on the trails and then come back (laughs) love it (laughs) Casey, do you have any uh, role-playing inspiration besides that for these guys? Um, Yeah, like I think this is... This is one where uh, I hope that players would want to um, figure out a way to communicate with them because they can communicate. And I would absolutely have them more as a, like, yes, a a slow moving, but not aggressive, uh, not aggressor, unless it's been provoked. And so then if you take that chance to actually try to talk to them, if you talk to them, I would have them speaking very like intelligently. And so then it's like, oh, what is happening here? <laughs> so 
So yes, maybe the gravelly voice, but very well spoken and just have a lot of information because they also don't age. And so they will just retain and keep information. They could have information from like hundreds and hundreds of years. So in that time, no, they haven't crossed the worlds to gather this information. But if you need something for, you need information from 500 years ago from some creature that lived in this area, but is long gone, this is where you can get it. <laughs> so I would use it that way and, and role play I, it that way. And I like that they're intelli- as intelligent and wise as a person, right? Yeah. They're, they're not, a lot of these like long lived creatures are like, super intelligent hyper intelligent wise beyond any comprehension no they're just they're just dudes yeah and they remember stuff (laughs) and they'll just tell you about it it's like sure i know about that i've seen that guy (laughs) i have no reason why not to tell you yeah (laughs) yeah i like uh i I was reading online too it says they take care of their the area around them right so they like look after other boulders and stuff like little so brothers almost. <laughs> so yeah, I just imagine them being like very caring about the earth around them. So like when you enter their territory, they're like, no, 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 don't, don't step there. That's that rock's favorite area. Okay. He's very personal. He's very, very territorial. Please stick to the path that's outlined. It's right over here. You know, look with your eyes, not with your hands. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do, do you think that when no one else is around, they animate the boulders and keep them as pets? And so they've got their favorites. Absolutely. And then like once the the minute is up, because they can't do this very often. Just like every once in a while they get bored or lonely or they just want to bounce the idea off. This Just a pet, just to talk to someone for like a minute. Mm-hmm. And then it gets up and it rumbles around and it interacts with the environment, whatever. And then it, it goes back to what it was. And the Gale door walks over and slowly rolls it back to the original position. Oh, <laughs> uh, and imagine if you like you, the trigger point for you to interact with this creature is because you, you, t- you're taking like a short rest and you sit down on Kevin <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I'm sorry, you need to get up. Like, that's Kevin. So, like, you can't sit on Kevin. <laughs> but you over there, you're sitting on Gregory and fuck that guy. Go nuts. Yeah. 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 I hate Gregory. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Oh I God. mean, I, I kind of think of it like otters, right? Like, they have their favorite rocks that they keep in their little pouch. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And then just carry it around. And so he's got he's got a literal pet rock. He's a rock with a pet rock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, when it comes to exploration, that's going to tie in nicely, actually. I feel like they're not underground. Like, I don't think you're going to find these guys in, like, underground tunnels and caverns and stuff. But I do picture little, like, outcroppings or... or there's going to be some places they're long lived erosion will be a thing. So they are going to want some amount of shelter. So when you're up on like the side of a mountain or a cliff side or whatnot, and you see that there's something that's been carved out and there's like a little path up to it. But the only thing up here is a handful of boulders and some small rocks. You know what? That's also what I'm going to do. Total sidebar. They can do one medium sized boulder for a minute, or they can do two small sized ones for 10 minutes or four (laughs) tiny ones for an hour. Right? Like, They'll just have a bunch of different rocks and stones and whatnot. But no, I I like the idea of them carving out or finding a natural place for them to have a a way to live. And I don't think they care so much about trees and plants. Like, I don't think they would, because roots will break rocks, right? If they would be picking up and uprooting and discarding any plant life that shows up in their area, right? So when you're going up the side of a mountain and there's, you know, ferns hanging off the side and those trees that grow out of like vertical surfaces and shit. And all of a sudden there's nothing. And it's a finely swept stone floor in a small little outcropping on the side of a cliff. That's probably a a Galeb door. (laughs) Yeah. So cute. And they probably have rivals with like druids that embrace the forest. And (laughs) so it's like, we don't like them. Yeah. (laughs) And I feel like, again, they would always talk in we, even though like they might just be by themselves, (laughs) but it's because they have their stone friends. So it's like, we don't like them. (laughs) (laughs) Do you Um, have uh, any exploration clues? (laughs) 
Yeah. And like the book does cover that, you know, they, I, I would love to put them in as, you know, a random encounter just as you're venturing in the forest. So like you see them kind of in their natural behavior, because that's really fun. But they are used a lot in as like guards or protectors of areas. So if you're going to use it in that way, um, I always like envision them as they're not just standing guard or being very visible. They are going to be in boulder shape and they're you're never going to actually see them until you're right up and you maybe even walk right past them. And then, you know, you pick a certain reason for them to to come up or depending on your passive perception of your players, you could have a boulder that keeps moving. (laughs) And if players roll high enough, they notice that it's like this same shaped boulder keeps showing up like (laughs) as we're moving along this area, like what the fuck is happening? And then it's one of these guys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Because we're literally recording this on Easter Sunday, it just occurred to me. What if the like boulder blocking the door to a cave, like a, that's a tomb, is actually just a Galeb door just sitting there and he <laughs> is the boulder blocking the oh, access? Right. Yeah, I like that. Oh my gosh. And then you try and like, so <laughs> your barbarian goes up and tries to move it and it just like starts laughing because you're like tickling it. It's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> yeah, see I just I can't think of them as anything but cute. <laughs> oh, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle anything for uh for the environment? Uh yeah, okay. So, you know, they they're pretty much stuck in their own area, right? So, how does it spend its free time between not seeing someone for potentially centuries, right? So, I was thinking that they kind of like beautify their area, kind of like uh, those Japanese rock Zen gardens. So oh, you'll nice. come up and you'll yes. find like all these like nicely designed areas around, but in a really remote area kind of thing. Or um, kind of building on what you said earlier, you know, like they have to deal with erosion. What if you found like a cliff and the whole cliffside is like eroded, except for this one tiny area (laughs) that he just keeps rebuilding over and over and over again. So, you know, he's just like uh, bringing these rocks alive to move them back up to where they were before. And so his stays pristine, perfect as it was when he like first got there. Aw, yeah, so cute. Oh, yeah, just something that stands out and goes like, you know, this is natural, but not quite natural. Like, it doesn't fit. It, yeah, the, it's uh, clearly cultivated. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Um, Let's move on to combat. My first thought, I mean, it, it has three things it can do. It has the rolling charge, the slam, and the animate boulders. I don't want to be limited by the animate boulders because I think that these guys should be able to animate statues or large bricks. If you had a stone giant that are making these huge, like pyramid sized bricks, you should be able to animate those as well, right? Like maybe it blows both charges to animate a large something. But because the other things are kind of minions of it, right? It's going to let them fight first. I can very much picture there being a, a small like rope bridge and it can what animate with it can see within 60 feet, like a 15 foot rope bridge between two like ledges of a cliff. And there are a bunch of boulders on one side and it's guarding the door on the other. And it's just raising its hand. And suddenly two of these things appear by whoever is going to come th- across the bridge. Right let those guys fight Mm -hmm. if they survive and i die we all die but i can live to survive um another day i can fight another day i can get my minions back another day right so Mm -hmm. so that's uh that's kind of i feel like as much as these guys are neutral and we, we haven't really talked about them fighting anybody if they're going to fight they're going to strangely enough be kind of a boss monster right as they've got these lesser minions doing their work for them yeah yeah like and there's some tactics yeah Yeah. tactics and strategy around combat yeah Yeah. i kind of i see them as um uh potentially because of this rolling ability they're going to be they're going to keep the higher ground and maintain the higher ground as long as possible 
So they'll they absolutely see you before you see them. Um, they're going to have a strategy around like there is a ramp. <laughs> so if they're coming down into combat, that is how they enter combat is you might see them lumbering from somewhere and be like, okay, what is this like lumbering like creature shouldn't be too hard. And then they dive into a ball and roll down the hill, the cliff down to you and then shit happens. So that like has to be, entrance. right? Yeah, <laughs> it's going to have, it's like, well, if you're going down this way and, you know, you've been warned, <laughs> let's get this hap, like, let's get shit going. And I think that would be fun. So yeah, yeah. some of, so a bit of a strategy to their combat. And, but yeah, ultimately they don't have a ton of, going for them in terms of combat abilities they they will just slam you with their fists or slam you as a ball <laughs> i also so, want to point out yeah that, they will that, <laughs> Jesus, that uh those like the animated boulders will also be able to roll they'll also be able to do all of this other shit as well it yeah. says that they've got the same stat block but what's interesting here is that the boulders hold on let me let me look at the exact wording here for a sec the gale of Durm magically animates up to two boulders it can see within 60 feet of it it has statistics like those of a gale of door except its intelligence of one charisma of one it can't be charmed or frightened and it lacks this action option right yeah. so they can slam but they can roll it is yeah. a missed opportunity if you have not named them mick and keith so that they can be rolling stones <laughs> Oh God, Adam! <laughs> All right, Kyle, rescue me from this shit, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that threw off my whole train of thought. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, they. Uh, I I kind of want to build on what you said earlier. Like they know their terrain like the back of their hand, right? They spend all their lives essentially in a single place. So they know every nook and cranny of this area that they're guarding. So they're going to draw out this fight, right? They're going to hit you once in a place they know they can get you and then run away, right? Like now I'm kind of imagining, um, you know, you have to travel down a tunnel and then all of a sudden uh, out of a side channel, this thing just comes rolling down, goes right through through your party and then goes out another hole it doesn't even stop to fight it's just like keeps rolling <laughs> and then it's rolling to another area further up uh further up the trail where it's just going to do the same thing over and over again it's going to like wear you down the action economy of that is fucking hilarious too because it rolls 60 <laughs> feet so this boulder rolls by and you can do an action in the middle of your movement phase so it rolls by punches you and keeps rolling <laughs> like it just sprouts an arm out of nowhere it's boulder clobbers you in the back of the head and keeps going yeah yeah fucking love it oh my gosh or like you guys all had that marble game growing up where you built the different pieces and like then you drop marbles through it yeah. what if incredible you, machine maybe marble works uh, marble. i don't know i think i ever played that one yeah i don't know what you're talking about you put all little sticks through the cylinder and then, is no no that... I'm talking, it's this, it's where we you were, have- different... We were all clearly children of the 80s and 90s because of marble <laughs> yes. games. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, you had like different sections that were different shapes that a marble would go through and you could connect all of those together uh, into a yeah. giant thing. Yeah, and then yeah, you yeah, put yeah, the marble yeah. in the top and it would go like straight and then swirl around and go yeah. down your whole thing. Yeah. Like, imagine if you created that, like, as, like, say a party has to get to the top of a mountain, but the mountain itself has all of these different things, and it looks like a place that, like, a, a boulder rolls, and everybody's like, what the fuck is this? But you have just uh. entered the Galeb's lair, and it has all of these means and ways to, to traverse its entire mountain really fast as a boulder. Oh, I like that. <laughs> so I it's like yours, Kyle, like with the tunnels and stuff. It's like you're going and then suddenly you're like, Shroom. yeah, <laughs> just like come sideways through <laughs> and then it's gone. And then, yeah. Uh, and then it's almost like a maze for your players too to try to find their way to the top of the mountain. Totally. That's Could you imagine idea. you get to the top of the mountain, you do the thing, the guardian, for whatever reason, like you sneak past the guardian which is a gale of door you get the whatever the MacGuffin is and you jump on the mine cart to go down the roller coaster yeah. and this thing because it moves 60 feet keeps pace with you <laughs> chasing you down smacking you in initiative right so you guys are oh stuck in a tiny little mine cart 
battling this this two or three of these Galen doors just hurtling down after you. That's <gasps> fucking fun. So that's, fun. That's a great idea. Okay. Also, kind of a sidebar, but so when it sprints while rolling, does two arms just come out the side and like push it even faster? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I love it. I also think that that it makes it whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. No, <laughs> Gets up like stunned for, stunned for one round. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all, all right. Any final thoughts before we move on to the next one? Uh, yeah, just like now that I think about that, rolling charge is insane because it doesn't require an action. If you sprint, you can go 120 feet. So can you just like roll down and then roll up an entire party? Because you're knocking the creature prone. So you don't uh, you don't even stop. You just go right through the guy. Yeah, yeah. It does take an action because you have to, it, you go 20 feet in a straight line and oh, hit with a slam attack. Hit, okay. hit the slam attack, right? So okay, fair, yeah. Yeah, so you're doing extra damage to the slam attack, which is two d six plus five, but now you're doing four d six plus five plus the strength save. Yeah, it's a decent so amount fun. of damage for a roll round. Yeah, but I also love the idea that you don't have to go, you don't have to. Um, oh no, it is twenty feet straight towards a target. That there yeah. it is. Okay. So you're not going to get that bonus if you're like doing the minecart thing and you're rolling beside them. You don't get the, the rolling charge bonus, but you still get to do your slime attacks. Mm. I feel like they, for CR6, they don't have enough AC or hit points to last super long. Like these guys are meant to do a fuck ton of damage, but they're almost mm. like, like they smash, they hurt you badly, and then they're done. Yeah, right? they're agreed. Kind of, I don't want to say glass cannon, but they're not going to withstand a, a, a six level party. They're not going to withstand four rounds mm, I, I don't know with the animate boulders though i mean if it's standing far enough back that it's yes, not going to affect the but i mean just like one of these guys just if they're not animating boulders or you've already killed them they they only have so much they can do right your party has yeah. way too many they defeat it in the action economy and i've got a lot of of versatile options right so yeah that's where i thought like an ac of 18 wouldn't be shocking because these are just made of like they're literally solid rock <laughs> and yeah. and as well like they do have that animate boulders but i feel like they should have more more abilities that involve morphing or shaping stone and earth like that could add a lot more fun like they could Make a wall of stone in front of your cart that's going down the boat. <laughs> let, let me tell you, with our party, the way that you guys operate at level six, I would have had two of these guys animating two each for it to be a fair fight. Yeah. I mean, you guys would have been bloodied by the end of it, and both Megan and Dan would be unconscious, but... yeah. <laughs> But it would be it would be a pretty fair fight then, right? Yeah, I I think they're missing a ranged attack because oh, they're hanging rocks. out around boulders. Why can't they throw one? <laughs> right, we love a giant that throws rocks, so why not this guy? <laughs> yeah, especially if he's got his least favorite rocks that hang around. <laughs> Fucking Gregory. Gregory. <laughs> yeah, Gregory. <laughs> All right, Might take well us on to the next one. Kyle. Once. <laughs> Okay, uh, so today I am covering the Zorn, uh, which is from the Monster Manual, obviously. Uh, these stout and imposing earth elementals are covered in a pebbly and rocky skin. They have three-way symmetrical bodies with three stubby legs that jut out in every direction at the bottom and come with a matching set of three arms that end in long talons surrounding their tops, which is also where their mouths are. Uh, between each of those arms sits one of three eyes that each face in different directions, and they can range in size from anywhere between three and eight feet tall. Uh, these sentient stools hail from the elemental plane of Earth and care for one thing and one thing only, the sweet, delicious taste of precious metals and gems. They sniff them out like truffle hogs and allow nothing to stand in the way of their feasts. Uh, they are the ultimate bane of the Underdark treasure seekers and miners. So while I couldn't actually find any info on where they got the inspiration from the Zorn for, um, based on its obsessive and insatiable appetite for one specific food and the wide mouth and dead-eyed stare, I can only assume they got the idea for this lovable scamp from Cookie Monster from Sesame Street. 
I mean, like, just look at that art and tell me that monster doesn't make an om nom nom sound while spraying bits of rock everywhere. Also, I have to say, they were looking at Cookie Monster through a triangle, right? Like, that's what this is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Someone had a kaleidoscope and was watching (laughs) Sesame Street and they were like, I got it. (laughs) God, the 70s were full of the best drugs. Uh, and I cannot say the same for this being a cutesy pet. This thing is, this is not cute. Not cute yeah, at all. No. Uh, so it, sorry. No, I just like the art on this is just freaking amazing. I, I do love yeah. a good Zorn. Yeah. <laughs> Zorn, right? Zorn. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It kind of looks like an uncomfortable poo. <laughs> pretty, I just, just popped in my head and I couldn't. <laughs> Yeah, it is, uh, it is. Yeah, it's weirdly lumpy. You're right. But yeah. I just I keep thinking about because it looks like the, the body itself is like a cylinder. Right. And the top of it is just this open maw of jagged teeth. And there's an eye around it on three sides at the base of like where the mouth is. But it's not a long body. It's fairly squat. This thing is like a fucking bucket with teeth. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And I assume that that it doesn't so much have a stomach as a gullet. Right. Like it's just there's no throat action here. I don't think it swallows. I think it mashes up and then just deposits just crumbled up gems and metals into its freaking abdominal cavity. Like, it, yeah, but it, it's an elemental. Is this? the? Oh, sorry. Is this the only elemental that actually feels hunger? Uh... I I don't exactly. know about only, but... But definitely, it says def- if starving or angered, it resorts to force. So it does starve, right? Most yeah. elementals don't require food or drink, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, this one definitely needs to eat. Neat. Okay. Sorry, Kyle. Okay, yeah. That's all right. Um, so it's a medium neutral elemental. Uh, it's got a CR of five. It's got a high AC of 19 from their natural armor, as one would expect from a creature that is essentially made up of a whole bunch of little stones. Uh, it has an average of 73 hit points and a walk and burrow speed of 20 feet. Uh, they have good strength and con, which, with a plus three and a plus six, respectively, and a plus zero to the rest, which I found kind of surprising since they seem to be a little more than walking stomachs, like you said. Uh, for skills, they've got a plus six to perception and a plus three to stealth. Though they also roll stealth with advantage when they are in rocky terrain, thanks to their stone camouflage trait. Uh, They are resistant to non-magical piercing and slashing damage, not bludgeoning, uh, unless made with adamantine weapons. And have both a 60-foot dark vision and tremor sense. Uh, For languages, they again speak peanut butter. uh, Or, fuck, sorry. Uh, For languages, they speak Terran, and they have a peanut butter of plus three. I keep seeing... (laughs) I keep seeing I proficiency bonus. Butter. <laughs> I keep seeing proficiency road written as PB, and it's just I see peanut butter every <laughs> single time. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> it speaks peanut butter. <laughs> is so nutty. <laughs> you just made my day. <laughs> oh fuck. I'm not even cutting this for the bloopers at the end. We're just keeping (laughs) it in. It's so good. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Adding to their stone camouflage trait, uh, they also have earth glide and treasure sense, meaning that when they burrow, they don't leave a hole behind them, but they actually swim through the earth, kind of like fish do through water. Uh, And they are also able to pinpoint by scent any precious metals or stones within 60 feet of itself. So if you've got an adventurer carrying a bag of gold, this guy knows. Uh, The Zorn also comes with a multi-attack, allowing it to make three claw attacks and one bite per turn. Uh, Its bite has a five-foot reach with a plus six to hit and deals 3d6 plus three piercing damage. Uh, While its claw attacks share the same range and attack bonus, it only deals 1d6 plus 3 slashing damage. Uh, I love it, you know, like it's it's a pretty good monster. It's pretty well-rounded. Uh, I do think it should have maybe either more of a bonus to perception or maybe uh, give players disadvantage to sneak up on it. Because, I mean, it has th- eyes on all three sides of it. You can see everywhere around it. Well, that, and pl- that plus 6, it's not nothing, especially at not level nothing. 5. <laughs> yeah, true. Oh, although yeah. the way DMs roll, that's they're just going to get an eight. So fuck it, right? Like, I, I think you're right. 
Yeah. Well, so this is Cookie Monster, and this is definitely an '80s, an '80s creation as well, because it's basically Tremors, yeah, crossed with Cookie Monster. Into I, I was just thinking Tremors on okay. drugs, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you see that this is definitely like cocaine fueled as well, right? The fact that this yeah. thing just keeps coming for your precious metals. Yeah, it's just it's just a hungry little guy. All you right. Know, like, and also based on biology, because it has eyes on all three sides, it is technically a prey animal. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, it doesn't hunt, so it must be. It forages. Yeah. That's weird to think about with those two. That is weird. Yeah, it looks... Like, it should be really scary. But at the same time, it's kind of uh, almost like a misunderstood monster. Well, I, I've got some thoughts. Before we, we go any further on this, let's roll initiative because we should be talking about role playing here pretty quick. I feel like we're naturally heading in that direction. Yeah. 12 again. Kyle? Six. I had a 16. I'm going first again. All right. So for role playing, I just want to point out they're neutral. Yes, they've got a language barrier with only being able to speak Terran, but their intelligence, wisdom, and charisma is all regular dude. So mm -hmm. this would be like someone who is hungry for the shit you are carrying, who walks in and looks super intimidating and can't speak to you, but is demanding, give me your gems, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. Are they necessarily hostile? No, I don't think I honestly, oh, I guess I'm going last. So <laughs> you can, that. you can pipe in. That was a question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't, I, I kind of see them as like scared animals. Like they are not, they're like regular feral animals, right? Like they don't, they only come like, you know how leopards and uh, other big cats or most big cats won't attack humans unless they're like starving. They're yeah. like dying. Like it's a desperation attack thing. That's how I kind of yeah. imagine these things. They don't want the gold you're carrying. They're happy with the stuff in the walls. But I mean, an animal's an animal. And if it's hungry enough, it'll go anywhere. It's going to have enough intelligence to realize that the last guy it killed was carrying magic robes or what looks like spell scrolls, but it can't read them or whatever, and offer trade for your precious weapons and uh, that are made of metal and your armor and Ooh. your gems. And like, I do think that these are going to be in the middle of a dungeon, a really interesting merchant that's, that's based on bartering. I like that. Yeah. Um, and I see them kind of as a, like, you know how when, well, if you have, if you have a dog and you have like a treat pouch and you're out like on this, like walking your dog and then another dog comes up and you greet it. Usually they shove their nose like right at the, tr your tree pouch. It's like, I know what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> and like <laughs> so i kind of feel like when you interact with these ones they are going to be trying so hard to be paying attention to like the communication but if you have a pouch full of gems they're gonna be like you know like distracted they're gonna be like i can tell what's in there yeah. and i want it <laughs> Well, they've, they've got the intelligence, wisdom, and charisma of a, of a regular person, right? So, however, all like their food source is so rare that I feel like they're they've got the intelligence, wisdom, and charisma of a desperate person. So, yeah, yes, <laughs> just just thinking about it, your party all has shit on them, right? Like every member, maybe not the wizard, not a whole lot of metal on the wizard. But everybody else has stuff. And I just picture it like, because he can see in 360 degrees and his mouth isn't pointed in any direction except up, he is going to try to walk into the center of your group to keep an eye on everybody with all the precious food, right? Oh, yeah. Wow. And this is going to be one of the few creatures that doesn't try to surround you, but tries to get right into the thick of your group to negotiate yeah oh, <laughs> and i feel like it and maybe you could play it as slight addict like it's you know it's all of its eyes are moving but it's not moving to focus on like talking to all of the party members it's looking at all where are all the pockets and pouches and I feel like when it senses something really awesome, it's also going to do that like salivation, like, ah, <laughs> like, like it's like it can't control what it's doing because it needs to just do everything it can to get what's in that one's pouch or that one's whatever. <laughs> oh, that's so creepy. Okay, so I have a question. So it says that it can locate the gems and stuff by scent. I don't see a nose on it. How is it smelling? Well, 
you can't taste anything if you if you have nose if your nose is blocked or you've lost the ability to smell you can't taste right mm -hmm. those two are directly like two sides of the same sense and its mouth is so fucking huge that I assume there's some sort of like it doesn't show it, but I assume there's a big fucking like very sensitive tongue in the middle of that. Yeah, I was thinking like the snake tongue. You know how they like taste the air? Maybe like three tongues, one from each side, because everything else is three on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just like while well, it's standing, talk to your party. It's constantly like. Yeah. <laughs> That's so creepy. Also, and, like I slowly I had to shuffling look up, forward. I had to look up what is considered a precious metal and i don't think that in D, &D uh, osmium iridium ruthenium rhodium or palladium are ever going to come up but gold silver and platinum will that's your money right mm -hmm. and then on top of that you should be adding mithril mm -hmm. So these will be yeah. the items that, that it's going after, as well as gems. So, And uh, do you think it would try to take weapons, though? Like, if weapons had, like, embedded gems or has as a blend of a precious metal, like, it's going to potentially attack somebody to, like, take their sword or take their shield or if they have you know a precious dagger that's from like it's a family heirloom and it you know has stuff like that it's not going to try and attack you to kill you it's trying to like take your weapon from you so that it can eat it I, yeah, it go I, that far? I like the idea of your party waking up like they they they're in a tunnel system this one does feel very subterranean to me right so <clears throat> So we're in a tunnel system. We've taken a long rest. We wake up and, you know, whoever was on watch fell asleep. I'll make them roll a con save or whatever. They fall asleep and they end up finding their weapons are missing, but they find them discarded nearby. The blades are still good. The leather work on the hilt is still fine, but the gems have been pulled out. It's dented around where there was like golden etchings up the blade and all the gold's gone. Like someone sucked and slurped and, and tore out all the pieces right yeah it'll still work <laughs> it's just not nearly as impressive and you're going to want to spend money on that when you get back to town yeah yeah i i can't imagine them wanting to eat the blades because they are still sharp and it is that that's where the soft bits are so yeah yeah I but imagine that but yeah definitely the gems off it and oh man she's <laughs> party getting a bunch of slobbery weapons back <laughs> oh you know what's going to be an actual real danger here is going to be um, arcane foci. Every sort of arcane focus has gems or it's made of silver or gold and on a chain and like mm -hmm. that. It, that's going to fuck up your spellcasters. Yeah. Oh man, what would happen if one of those things ate a soul cage? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> well then you definitely ho have to hang on to it and hope it poops. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right. Let's move on to exploration for a moment. And there's mine, speaking of poops, um, <laughs> but not actual poops. All of the discarded stuff that it leaves behind, because it's it's working through metals and it's working through ores and it's working through items that people are carrying. You know there's going to be a herd of rust monsters that follows this thing around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and like cleaning up after it. So you would find when you enter kind of its territory do we get any information about layers no there's no they, they're they're migratory because they have to go where the golden gems are sure but let's assume that it's you know you're going through a series of tunnels and whatnot and there's a silver vein through it right like and so you would see that th that the walls of the tunnels have been like stripped and pulled apart but you're also going to find bits and pieces of wood and discarded leather and Everything that would be left behind, um, like backpacks that don't have buckles, right, or anything else, because everything is, is all the precious metals and gems were eaten by the Zorn. The rust monster cleared everything else out. Love it. So a rust monster, does it affect precious metals or is it just like iron? No, it does because affect precious metals, but... Um, they're pretty weak. Let me bring it up right now. Just to, I know we covered it on one of the um, 
monstrosity episodes before. I can't remember if that was a Patreon only. Yeah, I was I was just curious because like, what if he had a rust monster as a pet to kind of get all the unwanted bits? It didn't off something, so he was just left with the precious metals and gems. Mm. They they, they corrode ferrous metals, then yeah. gobble up the rust they that they create. Okay, so I don't think gold, silver, or platinum is no, and I no. don't think mithril would be either. So. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like it gets a rust monster to shuck its corn for it. <laughs> That's gross. Cute. <laughs> so it's any metal that contains iron. That includes okay. stainless steel, right? So yeah, all right. Yeah, but nonetheless, in the Zorn's efforts, there's going to be so much cast off. That is exactly what the rust monster is looking for. Yeah, I want to. I want to say the Zorn acting. Saying, you know, it's it's got more, like, it doesn't have massive negatives and any abilities that maybe it would end up having some sort of an accord with these rust monster creatures in, in the sense of, okay, I'll tolerate, you guys can hang around. And, like, it has, like, you know, a bunch of rust monster pets. <laughs> in each yeah. one. Yeah, that's, in- what, that's what I was thinking, right? Like, it, it goes... Here you go. I've got these swords or, you know, here's a shield. I only want some of the stuff on it so you can eat the bits I don't need and then I'll just take what's left over, you know? Yeah. I I just picture each one of these hands on each one of the corners of the triangular body as these arms with these three big claws and each one is gripping a leech that goes to a rust monster. (laughs) <laughs> and it's just like like take, taking his taking his little rusties for a walk. Oh. <laughs> All right, now it's cute, Casey. <laughs> Is that what? It is? Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do think that it's it's useful to point out the little quote that they have here. It says in the monster manual, keep a few gems in your pocket. A hungry Zorn is a helpful Zorn. So you can bribe them and get them to, to lead you places. Assuming you can uh, communicate. Mm-hmm. Yes, because they do have a language. <laughs> do you, Casey, do you have any like uh, exploration clues or tips for these guys? Um, oh, man. I so the the ability to burrow through the earth like earth glide meaning this thing is just swimming around in the earth I feel like is absolutely a means and ways to foreshadow that these you're in the realm of these creatures you you notice some tremors and maybe if <laughs> Anyone you come across, it's like, oh, yeah, that happens all the time. We don't really know why. And then you go like a few miles later and it gets more and more and more. <laughs> well, the thing, the thing about Earth Glide is it doesn't affect the ground. Like it basically just merges with it. Yeah. So, yeah, but I, I, so it's like, sorry, I like, assume you're still going to feel it because like ripples yeah. in the water, but it's not going to leave tunnels or cave ins or anything, right? I, from what I understand, is it. It doesn't disturb the material it moves through. Yeah. It doesn't like... Oh, cool. Okay. Wow. But I yeah. feel like it would still... Like, so no, it's not, you know, like making the ground dip where it may have been burrowing underground or anything. But if it's mm-hmm. moving through the ground, I feel like there would be that ripple effect in the sense that there might be... Like the ground might... Sh- like there might be a tremor that happens because like swimming in the ocean, you know, if you do that near the surface, you're going to get that ripple effect where you can sense there is something moving around, even though, you know, it's not, I don't know. I just feel like that would be a fun way to um, entertain the idea that there's this creature that's just, you know, hanging out, swimming around, looking for gems in the ground underneath you while you're traversing across (laughs) somewhere. I also feel like if you can get it on your side, it's going to be able to like travel with you, but underground is like a, a secret ally. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's it's funny. It's it contradicts itself here in the lore. I'm looking at it. It like Kyle said, it glides through stone and dirt as easily as a fish swims through water. You can feel a, a fish swim past you. But yeah, the very I, next sentence says it doesn't displace earth or stone when it moves. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, no whole tunnel hole or hint of its passage. I think it's just a, like an analogy that they use for the fish. Right. Like yeah. that's how easily it goes through. But the actual mechanic of it, or at least how I imagine it in my head, is it's kind of like 
phasing through, right? Like the atoms split so that they fit in between the other ones. Yeah, happy, happy magical bullshit. But like, yeah. yes, I. It's almost like phasing, right? Like, um, a Kitty Pride in X Men. Yeah, right? yeah, that's kind of how I imagine it. Um, that no, we got camouflage means that you're never gonna know this thing is there until it wants you to know. Yeah, I, I we gotta stick with like the '80s theme, and this is Tremors. <laughs> <laughs> the X Men was '80s too. Come on now. <laughs> yes, fair, fine. And it does start with an X, so stronger connection. <sighs> <laughs> yeah take that casey <laughs> Fine. Uh, what uh what uh exploration tips or tricks do you have for these guys i mean there's i don't imagine there's a lot of subtlety to them there's they're interested in the food and that is it so you might come across corpses who are not really looted but you'll find their gem bags ripped open or their coin purses ripped open but everything else is left still or you know uh there are deep gouges in the walls from where it's like shredded to get at a vein uh stuff like that but see and this is what's interesting to me again is their main thing here is they don't disturb rocks and stone so even if they wanted to get to the vein would they be leaving deep gouges or they just be reaching into the wall and scooping out the metal, like phasing they in. They don't disturb it. it. Yeah, they don't disturb it. But, but the metal. But the metal does, right? Yeah. So yeah, they yeah. might reach in and then just pull a chunk. So yeah, maybe there's like a lightning scar through the wall of where this ore came out, but everything else is undisturbed. Almost like the wall itself explodes in very specific patterns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And of course, we're focusing on metals, gems as well, right? So you would find these guys in crystalline caves just like eating the shit out of everything. Yeah. Mm. They're going to be big like on a... grottos. Yeah. And like, <laughs> you could find like, hey, where are we at? No, this is more like a adventure idea. But what if you are hired by a dwarven community to come in and get rid of the Zorn because it has come into the mines and is fucking everything up and taking what they're trying to mine and eating it. Yeah. And then there's rest <laughs> monsters in there too. So when it comes to combat with these guys, um, I'm thinking, I mean, the multi-attack is formidable, especially at, at level five, right? Yeah. You're getting four attacks out, the fourth one doing 3d6 plus three, these guys are going to fuck you up, especially because you're not going to get much warning that they're coming, but they're neutral. I think that depending on the Zorn themselves and their previous experience, you may very likely run into a Zorn that walks into the party and the only words in common it knows are friend and trade as it holds out shit to you that isn't metal, right? And you're equally as likely to run into a Zorn that just waits until you're asleep and like reaches out of the ground, grabs your sword and just drags it into the fucking ground with a loud <laughs> foof, right? And then suddenly the the sword is gone and where it was a moment ago is some displaced earth, right? Like it could be one or the other, depending on what the DM wants the backstory of this specific Zorn to be. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and it talks about like like that's all that's truly all they want. And so I think sure there's a level of communication and negotiation and trade, but if they don't end up getting all of the gems or all of the precious metal that they have sensed and want, they're not going to give up. So I don't know, I feel like maybe there'll be some rudimentary strategy going on where it's like, "Oh, you say no? Okay, fine." And then they'll like go away, but then you'll see them plotting to like pit pocket you or like they will just like, it will end up coming back into combat because they truly can't let you go without getting what they now know you have by just mm. their own senses. So it's going to come around to them being a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more and more until they'll just take it by force if you're not going to give it to them. So more than likely, you're always going to end up in combat with, I think, these ones, which is not the same as the, the last one. But I also think that they're not going to fight to the death, right? They're fighting so that they can eat so that they don't die, right? So if they yeah. start to lose, they'll bail and they'll just go yeah, into the ground. So they'll just fuck yeah. off. I also think that if they get what they want, they'll fuck off, right? So I think these are short one to three rounds of combat, which AC of 19 will help it live through, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I like, I don't know if this is actually 
rules as intended, but does it even need to surface to attack if it can just uh, throw an arm up from the ground and hit you with one of the claws? No, right? it like, absolutely does even... not. No? No, mm. I, I, I think about it like this. If you're doing 3D play and Aarakocra is hovering over a goblin, the two can mm. attack each other. Right. If you're doing um, a Sahuagin and a Sea Elf and they're like vertically stacked, they can still fight each other. Right. Yeah. But what so a Zorn can get underneath and still attack. Right. Or even adjacent because of how diagonals work on a grid. But I don't think that that they'll be able to attack back because it's got full cover. Yeah. Mm. Exactly, Trixie. right? And it's got tremor sense, so it knows where you are at all times, and it doesn't even need to worry about that. And treasure sense, so it knows specifically where you are, not just where a creature is. It's not going to get distracted by a horse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So why So why would it be... It, it's, a, it's a challenge rating of five, which is one point lower than the last one, and I feel like it is actually more of a threat potentially is it just because it's truly not trying to destroy you if it can get the treasure is that why it would be that way um, it might not be interested in, yeah might not be interested in a fight at all right like <laughs> it just it's gonna try to steal from you first actually a couple of things would it understand the value of items that it is trying to trade could you get a very outside like it'll be like i'll give you this uh wizard staff that's i don't know let's say it's a wondrous item for you know three pieces of gold but it's not very shiny so you know or it's not very shiny so i'll give it to you for three pieces of gold but then it sees like a pile of silver and it goes oh that's you know that's worth a lot let me give you something that i think has a lot of value or i don't know i kind of lost the train of thought on that one no 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 yeah, I'm with i know you. what you like, mean yeah mm -hmm. like it does it inherently know that gold is worth more than silver to humanoids? And yeah. I think unless it's learned that, I don't know why it would think that. I think that it's going to know that, um, like, if, if it's in the area, because they're migratory, like they, like you said, they move through mountain ranges and through mines and whatnot. They would know what's precious. If they're eating a whole lot of silver, because they're in a silver mine, then maybe gold is a delicacy. But if they're eating a whole lot of gold, Silver's a little different. I'd like that, right? So it might, again, be specific to this Zorn in this area, right? Yeah. I've been eating sapphires for weeks, but you got a little bit of platinum, I'm in, right? Um, do we have any final thoughts on these guys before we move on to the last monster of the day? Uh, yeah, okay. So I had this one more idea. Then it doesn't take no for an answer. It doesn't really understand no, but it will try different things, right? Violence is the last resort. So I might try to trade with you first, but you, it doesn't have anything that you want. So it goes, okay, then it's going to try to steal from you, but you keep tracking it down and taking your stuff back. So fighting is going to be the last one that it does. It's like, well, if they won't give it, if they won't trade it to me, they won't give it to me, then I guess I'll have to kill them for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's your levels of, of tactics in a combat scenario or in an encounter. I I want to point out, I think the other reason that this guy is a, is a CR5 as opposed to the Galeb door because you asked why is that one a uh, challenge rating a six? It can yeah. summon others. A Zorn doesn't. Zorns are meant to be solo, which means even right. though they've got a multi-attack, they don't have ranged attacks, which means the action economy and spell casting is very much on the side of the players, which it yeah. just means, remember, challenge rating is not what level it should match up against. It actually is at uh, what level is it no longer deadly. Right. It, it is unlikely for someone to die if the party, if the entire party of four is level five or higher. With a Galeb door, if you get into combat, you're unlikely to die to level six or higher. This challenge rating system is flawed. It falls apart very easily. Um, just environment alone can fuck up an, an entire encounter. However, that's what it means, and that's why it is that way, right? Yeah, yeah, fair. Like we were saying before, the Gale of Door, if you're going to fight it, you're going to be eight rounds into combat before you might even get to it because of the others. Yeah. So that's, I think, why, why it is the way it is. So this brings us on to the last monster of the day, and that is the Gargoyle. I feel like I don't really need to spend a lot of time explaining what a fucking gargoyle is because most people uh, either have seen architecture or have watched the absolutely amazing cartoon show from the 90s um which was just that and and 
the old X-Men and Batman and the Animated Series were like the staples. That was a trifecta of my fucking childhood. But um, gargoyles in Dungeons and Dragons are actually earth elementals. They're medium sized and they are chaotic evil. You're not going to find good versions of these guys. Um, before I get into kind of their lore, I do want to say they're just a CR of two. So they're pretty weak compared to everything else. But you rarely run into just one. So the idea here is that they're about as malevolent as they can possibly get um, when it comes to earth elementals. A lot of earth elementals are neutral. Gargoyles are absolutely fucking not. They like to team up with demons because they're mean as fuck and they want to hurt. They're there for torture and pain and murder. They look like devils and demons. Real gargoyles, not the, the stone ones in Dungeons and Dragons, were the inspiration for the like stone statues that are on you know, bridges and castles and manors and whatnot. There are gargoyles out there, but they're based on these horrifying creatures. The creatures themselves have this wicked reputation for being just the nastiest sons of bitches out there. When it comes to gargoyles themselves, there's not a whole lot of uh, inspiring lore behind them, except the fact that they're total assholes. It's point. Uh, it's it's worth pointing out that there is a tie to the plane of elemental um, earth, but most importantly, the prince of Elemental Earth, who is Ogremok, who is just the elemental evil. Now, Ogremok doesn't create gargoyles on purpose, but he does create them. Wherever he goes, he ends up leaving behind shards of broken rock in his wake. But they end up with these little bits and pieces of sentience and consciousness. And over time, they will merge and they will form and they will burst forth as creatures. These creatures are gargoyles. But they're built from his evil sentience. Ogremok hates air elementals. Everything from the plane of air, especially Aarakocra. So gargoyles also particularly hate anything from the plane of air, and specifically Aarakocra. And they will actually, like, hunt down and fight Aarakocra at just the most basic provocation. They love to destroy the happy little bird people. But they also love to destroy everybody. So we, we love that about the gargoyles. They are non-discriminatory. Yeah. <laughs> And do you think that's why they have been given given the ability to fly is so that then they can fuck up things that use air? <laughs> you know, absolutely. That just <laughs> that just feels right, doesn't it? Yeah. So unfortunately, they only have an AC of fifteen and only have fifty two hit points. That doesn't feel like a whole hell of a lot, and you're probably going to end up hitting them, especially because you're you start off with a base of probably 12 so you need to roll a three or higher to hit one of these guys wah, wah. Mm -hmm. however um or sorry you know don't have to roll a three but it's likely that that you only need like a plus three weapon to, to hit them so you're likely going to fuck them up pretty quickly and pretty easily except they got a fly speed of 60 and uh sorry and they've got damage resistances out of the ass that's bludgeoning piercing and slashing from non-magical weapons that aren't adamantine also, they're immune to poison, exhaustion, the poisoned condition, and being petrified. All of this is pretty hefty for a CR2. Mm -hmm. So yeah. even the AC of 15 and the 52 hit points, that's beefy for a CR2. One of these guys should be able to take on a level 2 party and really give them something to worry about. I feel like these guys need to come in swarms, and so I like to use gargoyles at much higher levels. We do have the false appearance, which means that as long as it remains motionless, it's indistinguishable from an inanimate statue. That's pretty standard. I love putting these guys in and around other statues. Uh, Casey, you have fought gargoyles on a handful of occasions. Yes. Um, I like to pair them with Medusas because then there's just a bunch of humanoid statues all around. And if you've got a couple of ones that look like imps or you have other monsters mixed in that have been petrified, the gargoyle blends in really nicely with the mob and then can come oh. and attack. Um, but it has a multi-attack, but it's really basic. It's one with a bite, one with the claws. They both do 1d6 plus 2 damage, and it's it's one piercing for the bite, and the claws are slashing. So it's not going to do a fuck ton of damage, and I think that's why it's CR2. But if you can get the action economy on your side here, you will fuck up a party pretty quickly. I think I had five of these guys ambushing your level 9 party, Casey, and it, it made you guys stop and think. Mm-hmm. I actually quite like uh, quite like the gargoyles because they're really good evil for the sake of evil henchmen. And, yeah, and yeah. With, with that fly speed, like as well, a party, um, 
like when your your more squishy characters stay back away from like the front where you're exploring a new area um they aren't they aren't out of that 60 foot range so everybody is a target once the gargoyles like reveal themselves Mm -hmm. i think that's what's also the danger is no one is protected by any means or way from the fight with them yeah, especially because these guys, they're used primarily as guards and guardians by other more powerful evil creatures. Like, they will team up with an evil wizard or a demon. doesn't even have to be a demon lord, just a moderately more powerful than it demon. And they're, but the guards, they're not like Galeb Dor who are like, oh, there's this one thing, we don't leave, here it is. These guys patrol borders. They're there for gates and for bridges and it's passageways. They're there to fuck you up in the middle of your exploration, not in the middle of your raid. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So let's roll initiative because I've got some questions. And I've been on fire. I rolled a 16. 15. 7. Oh, Kyle. Um, Role playing. But I don't have a whole lot. They do speak Terran because they're an Earth Elemental. Of course they do. However, Mm -hmm. um, I think that the only word in common that they know is bleed. (laughs) <laughs> and that's probably it. So um, they're just nasty. You're not going to be able to uh, negotiate with them. You're not going to be able to uh, to make them stop an attack once they've started. And if they have the upper hand, they're going to press that. So I don't see there being a whole lot of this. Um, unless you were mm-hmm. to capture one and torture it right back to get information. But you guys are supposed to be heroes, so don't do that. Yeah. Depending on the party, I suppose. <laughs> I don't know. I, how do you torture? I can't imagine that they are capable of feeling pain. Well, they're still creatures, right? Like every creature that that is ambulatory, that's awakened, that's sentient, can feel pain. But I, I feel like, I, how do you how do you torture it? You start breaking fingers and horns and ears and shit off of it, right? You yeah, the difference it between it. like a sentient animal though and this is it's made up a bunch of like sentient rock pieces. There's no nervous system. There's nothing like there's no beating heart. It's just got a spark of an evil deity inside of it. Yeah, that's true. Um, I still feel like it. The more that you cripple it, like because it's it. That's the other thing is it won't be able to heal. Yeah. Right. And if so, it, can, I guess also it's torture to it if it can't inflict torture on other creatures. So if you break off its arms, legs, and wings and just leave it, yeah, there on the ground. But I mean, that's real dark. So. <laughs> yeah. I kind of think maybe this comes into play a little more when you're in a uh, like swarm scenario where all of them are flying above you and kind of causing chaos or initiating the fight in that way. You might get like, I know I'm probably, uh, we just, I just like did a bunch of studying on uh, harpies and I fucking hate harpies. But that's the vibe I get that they would give off when they're like all flying together. Like maybe some like evil laughter or like evil sounds like their wings would make this loud, like whooshing sound in the air because they're made of stone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So like you kind of use that for the role playing bits where it's like the sense of terror from them being a large group versus just the one. I don't know. Yeah, Actually, you know what? I think a harpy team up would be good. That seems like an ideal kind of thing, right? Like they get lured in by the harpy and then these things soften it up for the harpy to eat. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I agree with you though. I imagine a lot of evil cackling from these things. Yeah, Yeah. like once you get a group or a swarm, there's always that sense of like, ugh. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I also just want to point out, uh, I love in the like the flavor text box uh the last line is on their home plane gargoyles carve out earth moats that ogremok hurls into aqua so they basically help this evil prince egg the aeromental plane of air yeah yeah i, I love kind of... the, the fact that they're they're carving out earth moats well these earth moats are going to be the size of like 
freaking softballs and footballs and shit. And Ogremok is like a gargantuan size. So hurling hundreds of these things at a time just into the plane of air to fuck up anybody flying. It's so mean. <laughs> yeah. It's so unnecessarily mean. That's some petty kid shit right there. Yeah, and I think that that summarizes the role playing for gargoyles. They will be absolutely fucking petty if they can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I also imagine that too, like uh, maybe as part of uh, exploration pillars, you know, all of a sudden like rocks will just fly at your party, but you can't figure out who threw them. Yeah, You're that's what I was so- thinking. <laughs> Yeah, but they're little, so you know it's not a stone giant, right? Who mm-hmm. normally yeah. throws rocks? So, I yeah, for exploration for these guys, honestly, blend them in with other statues. Have lots of statuary around before you ever run into a gar- uh, gargoyle, so that your players will just find it mundane. Because any time that my party rocks up to any sort of statue at all, they immediately try to fight it, or they keep an eye on it. They narrow their eyes; they're suspicious as all hell. Because I've used enough gargoyles and and moving statues in the past. We need to add more statues into our games all of the time just to make people feel like it's normal, right? We have to normalize Mm -hmm. it. So um, the other thing that I want to do is I don't want them to necessarily have like the perch on top of the whatever. That's great. But what about like the relief that's carved into the wall that they can settle back into so they look like they're part of a giant carving and then they will come out. Okay, yeah, I like that. I also in the past have put them, although I don't think I did it to you, your guys, Casey. It's been a long time. I used to put these guys in um, uh, road work as well. So there were like carved stones and they would be laying down within the stone and there'd be all of these etchings and carvings along the ground of different battle scenes that you would like walk across and would tell a story. And then the gargoyles would come up out of it and attack you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a clever way of using them a little differently. That's my problem with a lot of this stuff. It's like a mimic. If you ever see a chest by itself in the middle of a, of a dungeon, nobody's going to go touch it. <laughs> like that's just not going to happen. They're going to, they're going to try to target it with a moderate spell first, right? Like a cantrip just to see what the reaction is. Everyone is so paranoid at this point that a gargoyle is just not going to be effective after you've used them once. Yeah. Yeah. Or unless you throw in a whole bunch of red herrings, right? Like gargoyles that are just regular statues. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of where I would be focused um, is using them as that. I also would have them as, I would just reflavor them to be stone demons. Right. And then they're just part of the demon army. Right. Like, Mm. that way i can swarm with eight of them and it's not necessarily a gargoyle so yeah um yeah clearly the exploration inspiration for this is hold still wait for your party to let the guard down and attack but it's so obvious that i feel like you've got to really obfuscate that a little more yeah maybe you could even tie them to like a bigger battle of whatever evil like creature or being that they are serving in the sense that you actually get into an encounter with that evil creature and they do some sort of like at some point during the combat they can summon the gargoyles and not in the sense of like bring them out of nothing but you know have a call or have a sound and then suddenly you hear the gargoyles coming from deeper in the lair and so it's kind of like they can recruit and that's how you bring the gargoyles into the fight is that like the evil creature has basically called them to arms Mm -hmm. and then they come that could be a different way of adding them to combat versus them you know revealing themselves as one of the statues yeah i like that as well almost like treating them like uh the flying monkeys from the wizard of oz yeah Yeah. like that's what i was kind of thinking like there's some sort of sound or signal that the party doesn't necessarily recognize but then you know a round or two later whatever you start hearing the sound of some some kind of swarm of something coming and it ends up being a, a swarm of gargoyles. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Kyle, any exploration hints? Um 
Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of said it already, but uh, I guess this isn't really an exploration hint, too. But they, I mean, they can remain stationary for years, too, right? So one of the things that might also help them hide is that they could be covered in moss and lichen, uh, kind of like, so you wouldn't even know a statue is there unless you investigated and like wipe some of the stuff off because it just looks like this overgrown pillar that's covered in reeds and um, like ferns and bushes and stuff. I really, I really mm -hmm. like that. Like, that's another way that you would make it so that people would ignore it and just think it's part of the like environment is by putting other shit on it. Like, yeah. Yeah. like if you were to have one holding the flag of the, of the castle that you're on. Right. And like, it's right above the main gate and it's holding a flag. The flag is billowing in the wind. No one's going to look twice at that gargoyle. It's clearly a statue. Mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. Or holding torches for the same reason. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. that. There's always opportunity to grab the lit torch from the side as you're going down. <laughs> They're, and you're grabbing it from a gargoyle. Yeah, their intelligence, I didn't really get into the stats because they're underwhelming, but their intelligence is a negative two, like it's a six. So they're sentient, but they're like, they're bullies, right? That's that's where we're coming from, really sadistic bullies. Which means that it may occur to them to be creative about this shit. If their tactic isn't working, they will eventually change, right? Mm -hmm. I don't imagine them like being on their own. Like, they're lackeys. Yeah, they really do yeah. feel like henchmen through and through. Henchmen yeah. and guards. Yeah. Totally. So let's jump into combat for a second. And I want to go back to my favorite thing that I ever do with gargoyles, and that is pair them with medusas um, and be happy little henchmen. Because in my world, if you can, you can use the medusa's eyes, if you can sever the Medusa's head and hold it up to the statue that they've created, it will um, unpetrify the person. So that means that those people are still there. And as Casey knows, they're aware of their surroundings and they're still alive. They're just stone and unable to move. I like it when gargoyles then pick up the statues and drop them on the adventurers, smashing the statues when they hit. Uh-huh. Just that emotional damage, Adam. It's fine. And <laughs> physical damage. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah. So I'm all about gargoyles. They don't have a ranged attack. It's bite and claws and that kind of sucks. But you don't need a ranged attack when you can fly and drop shit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think I think they might be like, yes, there's they'll have some strategy, but they'll also just be reactive in the sense that say there's a bunch of them and they're flying above, they will observe what's doing the most damage to them and then just attack that. So like if they see the barbarian smashing a bunch, it will go after them. But if one of them notices the wizard or the sorcerer set off like a ranged spell, they're going to be like, oh, that one's doing shit and just like swoop down and attack that one. Like, I don't think they're going to like all attack the same creature and work that strategy. They're kind of going to try and just attack where they notice there is a threat. And they're like, because it's just going to be the fun of it, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to get that one. <laughs> so it's going to be a chaotic fight because they are chaotic evil they're also totally going to attack the weakest person that they see right it's the the bully mentality of pick on the little guy yeah, yeah. like there's not gonna be yeah like we've got to take out the biggest one first it's going to be huh what's this one doing over here <laughs> yeah uh yeah i was thinking like on the opposite side of the coin of you know picking up statues and dropping them on people if you have a little person in your party, like you have a gnome or a dwarf, a gargoyle Ooh. is definitely going to try to pick them up and bring them high and drop them because that is sadistic as hell. I want right? to point they out as well watch. that they're usually guards near gates and fences with sharp points at the top. Ooh. Mm, yeah. Mm. Or bridges. Or moats. Like, it's not It's not even like just dropping onto the ground again, although that is great. It's dropping onto shit, right? Like, that's... I. That's that's worse than dropping the the stone people. Yeah. Oh my god! If you have like a wooden bridge that your party is crossing, and then these guys are just dropping stone statues on pieces of the bridge to try to like knock mm -hmm. holes in it, like from under your feet of the party, trying to turn it into like a little game. So yeah. good. Yeah. So good. Uh, yeah. It's the <laughs> this is when you hope that you do have lots of NPCs in your party. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, I'm gonna be. They're going to be dropping shit on the mounts, right? They're they're gonna yeah. try to kill your horses and your pets because that's like again cruelty. They want you to yeah. suffer. Yeah, interesting. I was also thinking like you know since they fly pretty much out of spite, like they're very heavy and they like should be way too heavy to be able to fly. Dropping themselves on the party right and just causing like double damage from the fall damage just dropping that atomic elbow from the top of a castle <laughs> all, right. all right so so here that the two things that i would absolutely give a gargoyle to beef it up one is siege monster so it does double damage to structures mm, yeah and two is fly by attack so that you do not get an opportunity attack when it goes by you to hit yeah, yeah makes sense now it's a cr3 and now i can use fewer of them and not drag down uh, my combat initiative that uh, you know tier two fights yeah yeah also yeah, I, go sorry ahead. go ahead go ahead no, I was just going to add, I, I like that idea of them becoming the the moat that's dropping from the sky because lots of times, um, especially your ranged spell characters are going to potentially do a attack up in the sky, an AOE effect to try and take out a bunch of them if they're starting to cluster. And I can just imagine that would be epically awesome if you destroy a bunch and you kill them as they're flying in the air. But then there is no opportunity for anyone to escape where they land. <laughs> and so then there might be some deck saves involved or maybe whatever. And then suddenly these are like plummeting to the ground and you could end up killing some of your party or NPCs or mounts because you shot them out from the sky. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Consequences. Do we yeah, have any... Uh... I... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I, I got a couple more thoughts. Uh, so, you know, they're not very smart. They delight in cruelty. So I feel like combat with them is going to involve a bunch of, like, shenanigans. Like, they're going to make try to make fighting a game rather than just trying to kill you as quickly as possible. Yeah. So uh, if you had, like, mounts, I could see them not even trying to kill the mounts, but just trying to freak the mounts out so that they run and scatter with you on their back. Right. Like they're going to chase off your pack mule with all your stuff. So you have to go chase it down or make, they're going to try to like make it run off a cliff or something. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That would add something. Yeah. I think they're going to want you to split the party too. Like if they're on some sort of dilapidated cathedral or something, they're going to wait for you guys to go by. And maybe even someone shoots an arrow at it and it hits the rock and, and led, like wedges into the rock and they still don't move. And so everybody goes inside and they start exploring and moving around. And that's when the 12 gargoyles come down and everybody like gets three gargoyles a piece now that we've split the party inside. Right. Like maximum chaos. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I like that. So, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap this episode up? No, I think I uh, think I said everything. All right. Well, it's almost time to get to the end. So, before we do, let's jump into our last info break. If you've been inspired by the conversation in this episode, please feel free to reach out and share your creativity and ideas with us and the rest of the community. You can reach us on Facebook and Instagram, or on our subreddit r slash it's a mimic. Also, if you're feeling particularly generous, please follow and subscribe and leave us positive reviews, likes, and comments. Engagements like that help us pop up on search engines and keep this show running. That's you, Kyle. Okay. Uh, yeah. So do you guys have any final, you just asked us though, do you have any final thoughts or inspirations? Yeah, I mean, my final I... thoughts was on the gargoyle only. I was thinking more like earth elementals overall. Oh. Uh, Okay, well, I mean, like, I like them a lot. I was actually, I do have one final thought in terms of the Zorn. I have a quest idea for it. Sure. Um, so, uh, a country is in trouble. Uh, apparently, the Zorn are coming through and wrecking their mining operations, but they seem to be only hitting silver mines. And in the end, it turns out that they are being controlled by a group of undead or lichen or fey to just try to get rid of all the silver in a country so they can't make silver weapons to kind of like soften the country for an invasion. Clever back like history and like lots of the, the party has to do some sleuthing to actually figure out what the hell is going on and what's the root of the cause. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like these. I like all of the ones we talked about today. Um, and to be honest, I would not have, I did not know that a gargoyle was a medium elemental, you know, like it just, it gave me a more informative look at these creatures and of elementals in general. So I was very inspired. I like Hon it. Honestly, like it feels like a construct. Yeah. And the, yeah. That's and the what Zorn I would feels think. like an aberration. Like these are really cool as, as elementals. That's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah I really like their backstory too. That's a really cool creation idea. Yeah. Anyway, that's all for this part of our conversation on elementals in D and D fifth edition. Please take a second to engage with a like, follow, comment, and review to help push our engagement. And don't forget to subscribe to find future inspirations for your campaigns. If you'd like to support us, we have a store with some merch and a donate button on our website, it's mimic.com, as well as a Patreon. This episode and others can also be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and most other podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. This has been an It's a Mimic production. Please check the show notes for this episode to see links, time codes, and credits. And don't forget to reach out and share your own inspirations. I, I want you to think about this, and this should be the only answer needed here. I hope you guys agree with me. Although, whatever, I don't kink shame. I, if there is a huge size, so 15 foot tall guardian that has to stay within 30 feet of you, every time that you want to get a little bit freaky, you can't send it. Oh, did I freeze? I froze. Um, oh. <laughs> hey, Adam. <laughs> it is a damn shame that I have to open up my door to get freaking Wi Fi signal in here. <laughs> oh, I thought you just got cut off by the sensors. No. <laughs> I don't know what the last thing was that you heard, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart. Uh, it love... was every time you get freaky, yeah, it's... <laughs> Kyle, uh, you agree on at least the small the small size? I do for different reasons. So, I mean, like, I've always had pets, so I'm kind of used to watching another thing watch me poop and, <laughs> like, get intimate, you know? It's... Not really that crazy for me. I was going to say I would go for the small one because the big one is going to damage your floors. Like you are not getting your <laughs> damage deposit back on an apartment with a giant stone elemental walking on your floors. Oh, God. And if you live on the third floor. <laughs> True. It's not yeah. just you that that elemental is watching get intimate. <laughs> Yeah, fair. Hmm. Given my 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 current living scenario, that would be definitely be a problem. <sighs> I do like the idea though of just having a dude that just like no one will fuck with me because I've got just this dude hanging out with me. It, and it's, of course it's, it's going to be It's the 30 feet that's the issue here. <laughs> if it was within a kilometer, I'd be fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not making, I'm making the rules and it's going to be close knit. <sighs> yeah, so I go uh, with the small too. Also, are we in the charge of feeding them? No, because they are elemental and do not require food or drink. Okay. We're going to, we're going to declare that. <laughs> Are we in charge of clothing them and are they anatomically correct? What? What is this? <laughs> you got a real dirty mind this morning. They are, <laughs> they are going to be non, like, they do not have genitalia. We're going to go with that. Okay. And... All, right. All right. Here, Here's here's my honest thought process. <laughs> when you said this, like the huge size one, the first thing I thought of was the end of the movie, This is the End. Have you guys seen that? With the gigantic freaking demon thing that pops up and it looks like it's made of like lava and brimstone and all this shit and then but it is anatomically correct and it was the one thing i was like ah god didn't need to see that <laughs> fair enough i, I don't remember that <laughs> i was thinking more along the lines of like iron giant when i was thinking of a giant thing also the one advantage to having the big elemental is you would always have the best seat in the house for a concert like you can get up on the shoulders it's never going to get tired true I, I like that although if you're never going to travel again well it could be your mount for traveling it's going to be difficult when i want to go to france <laughs> <laughs> looks like we're going by by freaking cargo cruiser yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Drawbacks, benefits, yeah, you know. <laughs>
<sighs> Although I would watch the shit out of that TV show. Me and my giant elemental. Yeah. It's almost like. Oh my gosh, now my brain is not remembering. What was the the animated show with the giant, like, squishy white guy? Like, oh alien. The, not, not not white human. <laughs> but, like, Hero the, it, 6 or something? Big yes. Hero 6? Yes! Yeah. Like I that. never saw that. Was that good? Yes, I oh. thought it was delightful. Okay. I laughed so much in that show. But yes, he, he would likely be, well, maybe more large. No, yeah, he was more, like, large-sized. But he was definitely noticeable and um, was always present. <laughs> All right, but I'll add to the list. That sounds like fun. All right, I yeah, you I know like... I I kind of imagine a giant Earth elemental like busting through a wall, it's like Kool Aid Man. Every time <laughs> yeah. I like it senses danger. <laughs> I'm here. It's like we need a quick exit. Yeah. <laughs> I have made one. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm done with this family dinner. Get me out of here. <laughs> Could be benefits. <sighs> Anyways. That was a good and ridiculous question. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> That's so ugly. <laughs>